I would like to welcome Tumas Ilves. He was the president of Estonia from 2006 to 2015, when Estonia became the most wired nation on earth. You can vote from your iPhone. They give out crop subsidies based on GPS analysis. There's been conversations working right now in Bill getting robot judges to adjudicate the judicial system. So an extraordinary digital transformation. He says that being president was the easy part. He's been working in tech since 1994. Uh, but President Ilves will be joining us. And then we have Antonio Miseroli. He's the Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Threats at NATO. What I also love about him is that he was a journalist working for an Italian daily during German reunification, showing that there is hope for my profession. So please welcome President Ilves and uh, Antonio Miseroli to the stage. And come sit here, here. Welcome. Thank you. It's an honor to be up here with you both. First question. So you put your whole country online. You digitized everything, or you worked in the process in which that happened. You also were president during what is generally considered the first cyber war, 2007, when Russia led a series of denial of service attacks, tried to take down your banking system. What did you learn from 2007 onwards, and what did you do to protect your country from cyber war? Well, in the 2007 attacks, which is a, which <clears throat> consists of a massive DDoS attack on basically everything in the country, not just the banks, but government, all government services and so forth. Basically, it was a shutdown. You couldn't uh, get access. But one, th uh, one misconception is no one ever got in anywhere. Yep. And, this, and so DDoS attacks, um, they existed before. They have gotten much worse since then. The reason why this stands out was there was actually the first time it sort of fit the von Clausewitz definition of war, the continuation of policy by other means. Before, it had been used for ransom, for blackmail, and so forth. And if you go as, I mean, you go back two years, three years to the Mirai attack, where they were, DDoS attacks were looking at the, the DIN servers that connect everything to everything, you can see this problem has not gone away. Uh, we have mitigated the threat somewhat, uh, basically, uh, by making sure that we always have alternatives. But this you the mean you always have alternatives? Well, that in fact, that if you attack, if you attack say, a bank, that, that there are other servers that can serve the public. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's about as far as you can go. There is not there is little you can do beyond that other than have lots of, basically you have backups. And how confident do you feel that if Russia decided, yeah, what, let's, we'd really like to take down the Estonian government again, that you'd be all right? Uh, I think that the big difference today is that uh, in uh, 2007, uh, no offense, but the, the North Atlantic Council, the NAC, which is the, which consider the ambassadors of all NATO countries, they had zero knowledge of anything cyber related and they couldn't really believe it or understand it. Whereas I think if we went to the NAC today and said, look, we have this DDoS attack, I think every NATO member would know what we were talking about and then would take the issue seriously, which is different from 2007 when only the United States and the UK actually said this, we, we know what this is and All right, it's well, a serious let's, matter. Well, we, we have the perfect person to ask the follow-up here. So Estonia gets attacked by Russia. They come to you. How does NATO help? Well, let me put it this way. Uh, NATO as such is responsible primarily for the O in NATO, that is the organization. So uh, cyber defense at NATO is about defending the networks, going from the website to information and communication, defending the operations and missions, which are in Afghanistan, Kosovo, yep. uh, and elsewhere. If an allies attack uh, uh, and claims credibly that the attack can be attributed to country X, uh, then the North Atlantic Council can now decide to apply Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, which is the one whereby an attack on one ally is an attack on all, and then the alliance can uh, trigger a response, a collective response of whatever kind in that particular domain. But do you expect that Article 5 will be triggered for a cyber attack in the future? Well, it's very difficult to predict this, and we don't want to set a sort of threshold for that. We don't want to indicate a red line, whereby if that happens automatically, Article 5 will be triggered. And for two main reasons. One, first of all, you don't want to give uh, a target to a potential opponent. 
uh, that could be tested. We know that red lines can be tested very easily and then there could be an issue of credibility. We don't live up to those commitments. And second, you don't want to say that anything happening below that red line is to some extent tolerated. So you want to keep the potential adversary uh, uh, guessing about mm -hmm. what your answer could be like and when that would happen. And I think that is part of the terence also in this particular right. domain. So what are the skill sets that NATO needs to build up to be able to respond effectively? Certainly attribution would be one so that you can really determine who is attacked, Estonia, whatever member country. What are the other skill sets that NATO needs? Well, there are also some technical and policy skills that have to be developed. Um, we tend to insist on the fact that, that uh, a, a cyber attack does not automatically trigger an in-kind response, so another cyber attack, that mm -hmm. offensive cyber would be automatically and exclusively used. That there is a wider spectrum of means that can be used. You, you may be familiar with the uh, acronym DIMEFIELD, which is diplomatic uh, information, military, economic, financial, intelligence, and legal instruments. And all these instruments could be used by, 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 by NATO in this particular field, although some of those are not within the remit of NATO as a political military alliance, I mean, particular financial and that, as they are in the, within the remit of individual countries that are part of the alliance. And yet, that is also part of the uh, deterrence uh, tool that the adversary does not know uh, what kind of response it is going to get in the event of such an attack. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is also the possibility now of resorting to offensive cyber, but offensive cyber means are national uh, assets and only in some nations can put these assets at the disposal of the Alliance in the event of a possible use. So far, eight NATO nations have done so. And is NATO the proper vehicle for responding to cyber rights? So NATO exists based partly on geography, cyber exists sort of in the world beyond geography. Yeah, th uh, this is a conceptual problem that I think we have to begin to address. Uh, the cyber world is, no, is not, of course, defensive alliances, defense since the first pre-hominid threw a rock at another pre-hominid and killed him, uh, has always been a kinetic affair where distance is a matter. Of the, I mean, that it counts. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization because it deals with a geographical area limited by you know, fighter range, bomber range, fuel supplies, tank, tank logistics. Uh, th those cons those will, will not go away in defense because military will still be occupied with kinetic force. On the other hand, we have to understand that today you distance has ceased to be of any relevance, and you can just as easily attack New Zealand or Australia as you can attack Estonia. Uh, and so we have to think in different terms. And so look, I've been arguing for a while that we have to look at who, who's vulnerable, and what we see uh, sort of what we have seen is that democracies are the ones that are vulnerable. Right. Uh, elections are targeted, disinformation campaigns, I mean, it's a whole range of activities that uh, previously, you know, I would say 15 years ago was not really the case. Mm -hmm. And so because of this change in geography and the way attacks work, do you need to redefine alliances as in all democracies should be an alliance. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that, and then you get into the criteria, what's a democracy, who is in, who is out. Right. But in terms of vulnerabilities, let's put it this way, the people attacking, you're not gonna change the outcome of their elections, mm -hmm. no matter what you do, mm -hmm. because their elections are not real elections, whereas right. democracies, you can change the outcome of an election. What we have come to realize, I think, over the past few years is that cyber is not only a domain in its own right, but is a sort of vehicle, a conduit for other hostile operations that can be carried out by a number of actors, including hostile state actors. And these activities go from destabilization, uh, subversion, uh, coercion, uh, manipulation, destabilization, espionage, sabotage, and they all lie, in principle, below the threshold of conflict, right. open war. And of course, we have fewer tools in order to deal with that. That means that a number of new capabilities have to be developed and consultation among allies, like mandate countries in general. I think anybody should be worried about the integrity of a national political system, not just uh, liberal democracies. And I think to this effect, of course, there is a lot of work to be done uh, among countries and at the international level. 
let me put, let me expand on this question about democracy. So the thing about the internet that most frustrates me is that if you had asked 10 years ago, I would have said the internet will strengthen open societies and will strengthen democracies. And yet if you look over the past 10 years, democracies are clearly on decline, authoritarian systems are on the rise. It's not because of the internet, but no. they're correlated. Do you think that technology ultimately is going to continue to disempower democracies or can that trend reverse and have it be more like the way we all thought about the internet 20 years ago? Well, I think, well, I think we're, too many people are still stuck in this kind of Tahrir Square 2011 yeah. moment, except authoritarian, I mean, that was, that was I mean, everyone thinks civil society rose up and used that in this internet empowered civil society. Yeah, well, then the authoritarian said, well, civil society did this, but we can do this a lot better if we put all of the resources of, a, of an authoritarian state into, into doing the same thing. Uh, and I think that was something that was forgotten in yeah. much of the discussions uh, eight years ago. Uh, uh, I think that we're going to have to really rethink uh, what the internet is going to look like. We see right now, I would argue, a sort of three-directional uh, splintering. I mean, not yet physically so much, but uh, certainly sort of in terms of uh, approaches. We have an authoritarian closed internet system. We have a completely laissez-faire system in the US. And then we have uh, an increasingly regulated internet uh, in the European Union with an emphasis on privacy, mm -hmm. which is uh, something that has, uh, has escaped the US and is completely irrelevant in the authoritarian Russian Chinese model of things. Chinese, well, go on. The Chinese no. would slightly counter that, but. No, I just wanted to say that I recently read a book by a couple of American analysts titled Like War, The Weaponization of Social Media. And it is focused mainly on what has happened over the past three, four years, including, of course, in the United States. And it's quite scary as a sort of picture. And whether we are prepared to face up to that, it is the late discovery or realization of the dark side of social media and, and and cyberspace, and I think we are still ill-equipped to do that, and precisely because of our nature as liberal democracies, we are less equipped than others, in the, mm -hmm. because we want to keep the, the space open, we don't want to limit the freedom of expression, and so on and so forth. So we are very vulnerable in that field, and of course there is a long-term challenge that is education, building resilience, and so on, education, education, yep. education. Well, in fact, the activists in Tahrir Square would say that's where it started to fall apart, was that the social media started to drive them apart after they had knocked out Mubarak, and then the authoritarian, and then the military figured out how to track them and use them. So you actually had both the breakdown of civil society and then the use of the technology by the authoritarians. Let's, let's stay on this, because it's such an important and fascinating idea. So we have the world splintering into three different internets. Explain how that splintering plays out in the next few years, particularly as we move into all of these debates about 5G, because I feel like the splintering of the internet and the current fight we're having about Huawei are inexorably tied. I would argue that, I mean, already within the last case, we're looking at an asymmetry where you're not going to disrupt an election in an authoritarian country, yeah. even if they call it an election. Uh, what we see is certainly Russia and China are, China has already closed itself in, or at least walled itself off from external threats. It seems that Russia is going in the same direction. Both countries are fairly good at finding people in their own country that are saying things they don't like. Um, whereas in our case, I mean, in the case of liberal democracies, uh, we will be, we will, we refuse to do that. We refuse to wall ourselves off, so we will be open to things. You can have 10,000 followers of a group called 10 GOP in the U.S. election in 2016, which was started by, started in St. Petersburg. So we will remain open. Um, with 5G, uh, again, uh, I, I don't know where that's going to go because this is even within Europe. There's a, there, there are varying approaches to this. Uh, the main problem being uh, distrust of Huawei, which was originally started by a general in the PLA. So there's this kind of. But, okay, so let's go to the Huawei question. So would it be better 
for the West to say we're going to build our 5G infrastructure without Huawei, which will reduce the number of vectors and the possibilities? Or would it be better to say, this splintering of the internet, really bad. <laughs> let's actually try to integrate 5G as, uh, Huawei as much as possible, and let's use their components in our 5G system. Simple, easy question. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, well, I think the fear is uh, the fear is that having uh, having something that originally began with uh, as a military company that that can be used for military ends to I mean one of the fears military ends to disrupt uh, countries that use it, and I think the other fear is actually uh, sort of collecting data from people, on people, on from companies. And certainly it w was the case for many years that uh, there's a huge amount of uh, intellectual property theft going on that was conducted by Chinese companies, not only in the United States, but also in Europe. Um, I mean, there's an even Estonian company that created something that the day they rolled it, two days after they rolled out their product, an identical copy appeared in China, and they didn't make it up on the, you know, in two days. Yeah. So these are, uh, I mean, those concerns I think uh, really have to be uh, eliminated. How does how does NATO think about this? Uh, not NATO. I'm speaking my own mind here. I cannot Antonio really speak on behalf that? of NATO. Uh, you know the saying in NATO about the chatter mouse rule that you cannot be quoted, but you can still be fired. And therefore, I prefer to, <laughs> I prefer to speak more on a personal basis also because there is no such thing as a, a NATO line on, on, on these issues. Fair enough. I think the, the difficult thing to predict at this stage is uh, China's behavior in this domain. Uh, as compared to other hostile, potentially hostile actors, China has a vested interest in preserving a global commercial system, a sort of globalized uh, trading system, and therefore has a stake in that. And anything that could uh, uh, threaten that is not in the interest of China. At the same time, China has developed itself into becoming arguably the most relevant player in 5G technology and, uh, and, uh, and uh, high technology and uh, connectivity. Um, the supply chain worldwide is heavily influenced by products that are all made in China, even when the provider is not Huawei. And to some extent, it's already a bit late to wake up uh, about Huawei because Huawei is already the main uh, supplier in, in parts of the world. Latin America is a case in point. Uh, I think that the idea of having better controls and checks of the security of the supply chain is uh, something to keep an eye on. Uh, it may have to be split into different aspects. It is highly technical. At the same time, of course, there are also some legal frameworks and regulation that can be approved. A couple of days ago, uh, the European Commission uh, released a, a recommendation, set of recommendations for its members because between this year and next year, up to 15 EU countries are going to auction uh, the spectrum bands for 5G technology. So it is important to have a sort of similar uh, approach to, to those auctions. And basically the concerns are uh, make a national risk assessment regarding both the technical aspects and also the policy concerns related to the fact that foreign companies based outside of the European Union may have deals with the country that hosts them that could uh, make it possible to have inroads mm, into uh, national security in your own country. Uh, the, the EU countries are expected to release uh, to the Commission the, the, the risk assessment by the end of June and the Commission will uh, uh, then release its own assessment in that, in that particular respect with the hope of having a sort of common approach uh, to this effect. Because, of course, we all know that although national responsibility is primary in these auctions, uh, we are all connected and therefore, even if a number of countries adopt certain security norms, others may not and therefore there would be clearly a backdoor uh, or uh, a, a, a hole in the system that would have been, would, could be exploited uh, by, by these actors. Anybody from NATO is watching, I think you should be promoted and not fired for that answer.